Hello. This is a sideshow. I'm Theodore Parker, and today is Thursday, August 25th, 2022. <clears throat> the sun is shining outside today. Uh, earlier it was 64 degrees, going up to 88 degrees. You had the mask, along with whatever other reports that are going on in your area in regards to COVID-19, etc., etc. <clears throat> in the news today, there were several items that kind of stuck out, generally taken from the top five, but as you go down the list, it starts getting into um, family issues between couples and also included is the um, $31 million settlement for Vanessa Bryant and another man who had sued the L.A. County Sheriff's Department, first responders, and several individuals in regards to photographs taken at the crash site of Kobe Bryant and Gianna and others and passed around specifically at the bar and then come to find out later on at some, um, some kind of social event as well. So, court renders a verdict and awards them $31 million to Vanessa Bryant. So, we start off with today's activities in the news. George Foreman sued by two women claiming they were raped as teens. They each seek upward of $25 million. Foreman denied the allegations. This is related back to the 70s. Foreman is in his 70s now. One young lady said that she would started that he started to groom her as young as the age of eight. Another one claims that they had contact or sexual contact when she was 15. Foreman is in his 70s now. So um, this is kind of based on you know, adapt adaptations of laws, changes. <clears throat> the lawsuit was brought under an amendment passed in 2020 to California's statute of limitations for certain sex crimes, giving victims of childhood sexual assault more time to sue. The amended law allows plaintiffs to sue within five years of discovering an injury caused by the assaults. So these two women, presently women, had chosen to move forward based on injuries that they claimed they recognized at an unspecified date and are suing him. This... Um, can be seen in another case where a woman claimed that she was assaulted by Bill Cosby at the Playboy Mansion at the age of 15, and they moved forward with her case. So um, as much as I want to say, while you were there in the Playboy Mansion at the age of 15, it had no bearing on it because they moved forward with the case against Cosby on that woman's testimony <clears throat> or allegations. So now George Foreman is up under the same type of situation based on the new California law from 2020. Moving on, how Trump has spent his days since the feds searched his home. Mostly entertaining friends, spending time on the golf course, which, if I remember correctly, was one of his primary concerns when he was serving as president. Had more time logged on the golf course than anybody else prior to him, and seems to let it continue to be his pastime full-time. 
Justice Department releases unredacted bar memo detailing decision not to go Trump, not to tr um, charge Trump with destructing Russian Russia probe. That was kind of a confusing title to me. I didn't know if it was referencing what went on with the documents that they took from Mar a Lago, whether it was something Trump had done before, exactly how it was all playing out. Excuse me. Specifically, Barr's deputies concluded that Trump did not break the law in any of the incidents um, highlighted by Mueller. This dates back to during the Trump administration. This includes Trump's firing of FBI Director James Comey and his earlier request to Comey to go easy in the criminal probe of his former top advisor, Michael Flynn. <clears throat> so it seems like there's like a little bit of a timeline situation with Barr. He asked for certain memos and then... Um, made a decision before the memo arrived and then signed off on the memo after speaking to the Department of Justice. A lot of back and forth, but unredacted probably would be the thing, means there's not anything crossed out on it. No little black lines, leaving the words and and the. So that is the significance of that article. <clears throat> He challenges all white city council in Alabama. Now he's on it. A few years ago, Eric Calhoun felt out of touch with the city council in Pleasant Grove, a small Alabama city of just under 10,000 people outside of Birmingham. Calhoun is 71 and he has lived in the city for nearly three decades. Couldn't find contact information for any of the five council members online. During the 2016 election, none of the white candidates running against him asked for his vote. Voters in the city had never elected a black person to the city council. Calhoun, like 61% of the city, is black. Now that being said, <clears throat> this is one of those things that you probably would just you know, blase on past and say, okay, so they didn't have no black it's kind of common occurrence, but not so common, but understood. So here's the thing. So Calhoun went on and checked it out and come to find out the way the city council was, was being voted on was not according to their districts, but they ran citywide. So this gave the white voters an opportunity to um, kind of keep things in hand because the districts where the black voters were at, they, they did not have the control to outvote them. So the council was always white, five, five city council people. So um, Calhoun, you know, went on to take measures to take it to court. So it was found out that they were not using the voting process correctly, and it was struck down, and now they have to do it by districts. And as a result of that, they now have a majority of three black people, including one woman and finally Calhoun, because one council person resigned against two, which means that the mayor there has to step in in the case of a tie. So the city council controls stuff like the police force, um, how municipal funds are spent, you know, important things to, to anybody in a city. Um, but black people should be included in that. And that's kind of how the way things played out. But now that they're on the council, you know, they've obviously start making some changes and things this nature. But as things would happen, this case is similar to one that the Supreme Court is scheduled to hear, I guess, over the next couple of months related to voting. And the same way that Calhoun pursued his situation, Article 2, in the voting legislation 
is the same reason that this case that's appearing in front of the Supreme Court is going to be heard. So small things, which don't appear to be so important, could have some significance. So if this voting process, like for city council, et cetera, et cetera, is heard by the Supreme Court and their decision comes back down, like there's no other way to say it, like in Roe v. Wade or something else like that, then we're going to have another hot potato in our hands. So I'm just saying, you know, got to keep both eyes open. August 25th, 2022, Thursday. Tomorrow starts the weekend. This is a sideshow. I'm Theodore Parker. That's it. Hashtag.